Hello everyone, welcome to this video about Peter Bernstein. And maybe you watched the title and it said Peter Bernstein's Gypsy Jazz Licks and you thought, what the hell is that all about? I'm gonna explain after this intro. So, I guess I have a bunch of new potential new viewers because of my last video that I made with uh, Jimmy. It was a big uh, honor for me to have Jimmy right here and we were uh, jamming some tunes. And I got a lot of questions, um, both in the comments, but also in private messages from people that wanted to talk about uh, improvisation, maybe Skype lessons. And they wanted to know how I learned to improvise like the way I was improvising because I learned somehow that I wasn't playing guitar for that long and I, I haven't been playing guitar for that long. Um, like seriously playing guitar, I think almost 80 years now and I started from zero. And apparently I'm now able to kind of jam with some of the, the great players and hold my own, at least that's what I hope. And people wonder how is that possible? How can you learn to play that fast, both learning and the technique? and the language of improvisation. And that is actually what my channel is all about. It is about how I learned to play. And for the people that have watched many of my videos, you know what I'm gonna say, but I wanna say it again before I go into the subject, because this topic I'm going into is related to this philosophy I have about learning how to improvise, is I never spent any time on the guitar learning anything that I don't, that I can't apply immediately to improvisations, to what I can play that night during a jam or during a gig. So that means that I would never practice, for example, a scale, because I would never play a straight scale in a solo, right? I, I don't want to play a scale. So I would never practice a scale. I would never practice an arpeggio because I would never just play an arpeggio in a solo. If I want to play an arpeggio in a solo, that might happen, a specific thing, and I would practice only that specific thing, right? Um, I would never spend the time to learn all the notes on the neck because I would never have to use that knowledge during improvisation. Right? And now it gets confusing because how am I able to play notes that fit the chords? Right? It is because the only thing I really study or I really do, apart from practicing technique, and I'm not talk going to talk about that in this video, is practice lines of transcriptions I made of great players or that I came up with myself, or I practice varying the lines that I transcribed. But it's all about transcription. And um, I thought it would be funny, or would be a good subject to return a little bit to Peter Bernstein. He's one of my favorite guitar players, um, which is ironic because he's maybe this, the single greatest example of a guitar player, that, a guitar player that's very obviously not playing any licks. He is really playing material that really fits the mood of a certain song or, or a certain song, it's very, I would call it situational, right? It's, it's not something you could just grab from a solo and just apply it to every song, which is what I do, which is basically what I do. And the way I do it relates to the fact that I don't need to know the notes on the neck. I'll come back to that. So it is now my um, challenge to, to do this with Peter Bernstein, to just look at his lines and see if I can apply them elsewhere without losing the context of, uh, my gen of the general flow of my improvisation. So I started a PDF with just 251 licks. And I, I, said, I said in the title, 251, 251 Gypsy Jazz Licks, because I'm going to demonstrate them on the Gypsy Jazz backing tracks on my channel and with a Gypsy Jazz guitar, which is a, I want to explain really very shortly why I'm playing a Gypsy Jazz guitar and not an art stop, even though I'm talking about Peter Bernstein. The only reason I'm playing a Gypsy Jazz guitar is because it's really a hassle for me to set up the art stop and get the sound right because I only have this microphone. It picks up both my voice, my guitar, and this little Bose speaker which produces the backing tracks, right? To balance that with the art stop, I've done it in the past, it's very difficult. I either have to uh, do a lot of mixing afterwards to get my voice at the same volume as the guitar or, or the guitar doesn't sound right. So I'm not gonna do that anymore unless somebody knows the solution. Well, the solution would be to record the art stop separately, but I. I really don't want to do that. That takes even more time. I just want to use this mic. So for now, it's going to be the Gypsy Jazz guitar, even when I'm talking about art stop stuff, which this is. 
So I prepared a PDF with three Peter Bernstein phrases and I'm going to talk about um, what I'm doing with them. And then I will have a episode after this, which is only for my patrons with three more phrases. Um, uh, if you want to have access to that and you want to have access to all the tabs that you're seeing like this one, you can always join my Patreon the link is in the description and you will get access to all these tabs and also to a bunch of patron exclusive videos in which I will continue this series on Peter Bernstein because I, rec I transcribed a lot of stuff now, not only these three lines, but I'm just going to talk about three lines for today. It's all two five ones in D. He, he didn't play them in D probably. I just transposed them. And what did I do with them? And then this is a nice opportunity for me to explain how I think about stuff. I didn't really take those uh, phrases verbatim. Most of it, yes, but I changed them sometimes, and I don't even remember how, to fit my way of playing. So my way of playing, <clears throat> really shortly, is based around knowing the notes on the high E string, the low E string, those are the same notes, of course, same frets, and the B string, right? <clears throat> and the starting point of a phrase is a note from a chord, usually. So uh, to give him a, a simple example, when I have to play a 2 5 one in, uh, let's say, uh, D and D, so E minor 7, A7, D, right? And I would play something like this. One, two, three. I know it starts on this B, which is the fifth of E minor, right? So that's... I just move my first finger to the fifth of E minor and then, I, and then I play this fingering that I memorized without being aware of the notes there. But I know it's a good line because I transcribed it from Django Reinhardt, this one. And I that's how I do it. And I transcribed lots of lines starting here, right? Like... Um, one, two, three, four, on. I say, well, it doesn't start on the B. No, it doesn't, but it is, my hand is there, right? It's, my hand is on this B, and then this phrase is right there. So if I want to play that on the 2 5 one in G, I just move, move my first finger to the fifth of A minor, which is here. Uh. It doesn't require for me to know any of the notes, it just requires me to know where I have to move my first finger. And that's how I uh, weave all these lines together, because then... Uh, I go to a D chord and I just move my finger to the fifth D or the, the root of D or the third D. But now I have a problem when uh, describing these Peter Bernstein lines. A lot of the lines, they start not on one of those chord tones, but maybe more abstract. So I change them in such a way that I can still kind of fit them. So this first line, for example, goes like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the, the, the what the line is doing, it, that doesn't really, I don't really care. I know it sounds good. I liked it. I transcribed it. For me, the only thing that's important is to start. How can I find this line on the guitar in the middle of improvisation, right? It starts like this. So it starts on a B which is, of course, the fifth of E minor. It starts on the, on the B string, which is, is okay, because I um, the B string is, I, I kind of know the notes there. So uh, I can find it. But for me, even easier is to, to relate it to the high E string. And the high E string, there's an E right there, right? It's uh, the root of the, of the chord, E minor. So I would just see that point and then move my second finger to the B string and then the fingering is automatic. I mean, you gotta practice it. It's kind of a geometric thing, right? I'm not even thinking about the notes. I'm thinking about, oh, I have to move my th second finger to the B string right here on the 12th fret for, for 2 5 1 in D. For 2 5 1 in G, the first chord's A minor, which is there. Put my second finger there. So this might sound very unmusical. You would say, well, what is it? Just where you're doing math or something? or it's like a puzzle. It is like a puzzle. It is like a puzzle. But don't be mistaken. I know what this line sounds like because I played it a million times to practice it, right? Or I'm going to play it. I mean, described it recently, but I will play it over and over. 
I know what it sounds like. I know what it sounds like before I play it. And because of that knowledge of my inner ear knowing what the line sounds like, I can string it together with other lines that I would think fit with it, right? Even though it's all based on geometric plays on my guitar, I, I would still use my musical musicality to make a musical solo out of it with varying levels of, of success. So let's apply this phrase to Coquette, which is a typical Gypsy Jazz standard. The backing track is on my um, YouTube channel. There's a link to all my backing tracks, to a playlist with all my backing tracks in the description. So in that song, there's a 2-5-1-D at the end of the both A's, or the A parts, and there's a 2-5-1 in G in the bridge. So um, I'm just gonna improvise, and when the 2-5-1 hits, I'm gonna play it in D. <laughs> the bridge I'm gonna play it. Let's do that. So that would be the first step, and you noticed I was already kind of varying it. The second step would be for me to kind of be more free with the line, right? Maybe start a beat later, beat early, two beats earlier, play some embellishments, skip some notes, um, make some notes longer. That can be all random, and just experimenting and find nice stuff. So let me try that for one chorus, and, and I might fail doing that, but th that's a very important to become free with the line so that you're not stuck to playing it exactly the same way every time. So I can. For instance, I can play them much too early, much too late. That would be a simple way of varying it. Now, I don't remember if I changed this line, but I don't think, I think this line is exactly like Peter Bernstein. But the next line, for example, let me get it. Um, I probably didn't change this, but I can, there's something interesting to say about it. This line presents a problem for me because it starts with this B on the D string. And I know now it's a B because I can see it in the music, right? But I wouldn't be able to find a B on the D string because I don't know the notes on the D string. Now you say, oh, well, we'll just learn it. But you know, that's not that easy. It's not that easy to learn the notes in such a way that you can find them every time during improvisation. And now that would be possible to do, but that would take a lot of time. So much time that I think it's wasted because in the end I would never use that knowledge because I already have a way of improvising which is based on, on geometric stuff, right? So. Uh, I don't want to add ge more geometric stuff on another string. I want to still keep the reference of these uh, two strings. So, for me, one way of finding this note, because I was thinking about it, one way to find this note is the, this E minor shape, which there's an E minor on the low E string. Right there, 
it's in that shape. So maybe I would I would see that shape on the neck, right, and then start there. So let's say it's let's do rhythm key, let's do B flat, then it would be right. Now let me first play the line. The line sounds like this: one, two, three, four. Three, four. Watch the slides, they're important, they're part of the sound. Right, so a B flat, here's C minor. So start there. And the rest is just movements of the hand, which you can just practice like mechanically while listening to what you're doing, so to keep the phrase in mind. Now let's do another key, let's do E flat, so F minor will be. Let's do G flat, so then we get A minor, A flat minor. Of course, a little bit complicated because there's an open string which will always mess up a fingering. You have to get to practice it separately. One more key, let's do, um, let's do E. So F sharp minor would be here. So let, let me just play this on coquette, the same way I was doing with the first phrase. So a bridge is uh, A minor, right? so it's here. I didn't find it quickly enough. Let's do it again. Freedom. Clear last line for this video. Uh, oh yeah, so uh, this one is easy for me to find because it, it starts on the fifth of the of the two chord right here with two approach notes. But I would still see this fifth here. One, two, three. I'm pretty sure I changed this line somehow to make it fit more the way I see it. So it's not exactly like uh, Peter Bernstein played this line, but um, it still has this kind of general sound in it with the slides and the the, not, the unusual intervals. That would be in D, 
So in G, 2 5 one in G, A minor, and start on the fifth of A minor. Let's play that. Of course, I, before I play that line, I want to end up low so that I don't have to jump. I mean, jumping is nice, but um, the goal would be to play more like connecting. So one point I was high uh, up on the neck and also on the high string, so I opted not to play it. But then the third A, I'm, I really try to head go <laughs> go towards a low E string and towards the B so that it fits. That's the way you fit those lines in. All right. So now maybe I wasn't planning on, but let's just take another song. Not too fast <clears throat> on my. Uh, I mean, I remember April is of course a really good tune to to practice it on, but it's pretty fast. I don't want to do it now because I'll probably mess up. Let's do Hans of Rose. It's very easy. Two five one in F. So let's do the, the first line. Remember, it started. I have to visualize uh, the two chord, which is there. And I put my second finger on the B string, and then we get. Okay, it's with open strings. Probably mess up because of the open strings here. That's easy. So I could do I could do it up high for F. Then there's a bridge. It's a two five to B flat. So then we get a two five to B flat C minor there. Let's do the second line. So the second line <clears throat> started um, with this. I have to have. Visualize this minor shape. So two five one in uh, F. So All right, two five one in B flat. And the third line starts on the fifth of the two chord. So in F would be the two. This the, the fifth of the two chord is here D. And the fifth of the two chord in B flat would be a C minor, so it would be a G, would be there, that would be. So let's improvise a little bit on uh, Hans Gross and just play any of these lines uh, at random.
something like that. Of course, it's not as fluent as I want it to be, but that's just the process of practicing these licks over and over. And um, who knows, maybe some of them will stick. That's another thing. I don't care about the result. I only care about the process. So I care about the work I'm doing, being very concentrated with these phrases, really trying my utmost to make them work within my solos. And then if one of them sticks and I start playing them in my solos, that's great. But um, if, if not, I'll just practice them again or I go on with new material. Anyway, I want to see how far I can take these Peter Bernstein ideas. These were pretty simple ideas. He has very complicated stuff, which I'm not sure I can make fit. But um, at least I'll make one more video for my patrons only with uh, a couple of more Bernstein phrases. And maybe I'll make more. We'll see. But uh, I will see you all in the next video. Bye.